Welcome to our quest of an operator that allows us to assign faults to all atoms lacking an acyclic derivation. Well, in the same way as we derived the fitting operator from program completion, we of course now look very closely again at loops and loop formulas and the mechanisms that were involved. However, the interesting historic detail is uh, unfounded sets, which we will be looking at, are much older than loops and loop formulas, which have been invented, well, uh, several decades afterwards. Anyway, that's just a, a side remark. Let us actually first get an intuition of where we want to aim at. So let's go easy and start with a motivating example. This is actually the example we briefly discussed at the end of the section on the fitting operator, where we saw that the fitting operator is unable to detect the cycle among A and B, and thus to make both A and B false. Okay, so how can we achieve this? Well, first of all, let's think a little bit back on what we learned about loops and loop formulas. First of all, uh, keep in mind that at the end of the section of loops and loops fo loop formulas, uh, we saw an alternative version of the characterization of stable models where we didn't only take into account loops in the sense of uh, strongly connected subgraphs, but arbitrary subsets. So one could say, oh, we throw in all the loop formulas for all subsets of the atoms occurring in the alphabet. So somehow just picking those that are really induced strongly connected components is an optimization. It's not really needed. So let's step back and just look at sets. Okay, first thing. So if sets are enough, if somehow or sets is more or less what we should target, right? Then the question is, what is the really essential concept? And I'd argue that it's the notion of an external support. So you take a set and you look whether the elements of this set have an external support. And if this is the case, great, here you go. Then you know that there is no circular derivation behind it. And that's more or less the intuition I want to convey with you on this example or going, you, going through with you through, through this example. Okay, but now there's one thing that is different. There's another quality, because once we look at operators, we also have a partial assignment in hand that gives us more or less the context of the computation. And this may actually influence whether there is an external support or not. Something when looking at loops and loop formulas, where we just looked at formulas describing the properties, was not there. And this is a new quality that we face now. But a lot of blah, blah, let me zip it again and look at the example. Okay, now given an assignment, and here again I took the empty assignment, right? We can ask, does the set that only contains A have a potential external support? As I say potential just to stay very vague, right? Just to say, could there still be something that support it? So has everything been ruled out? Okay, in this, in this uh, easy setting we see that given that we don't know anything, right? The rule A if B could provide a potential external support because it derives A and it relies on B and B does not appear in this set. So this is actually a ex potential external support. Okay, let's switch context. Let's assume we look at a partial assignment where we already found out that B is false. Now this external support drops out and actually the set A or A itself does not have any potential external support left. This is gone. And this is actually a situation that would be detected by the fitting operator. And the fitting operator would, would in this case, allow us to make A false. OK, then just finally, in the case actually we know that, a, that B is true. Well, that's more or less the same case as, as the first one. Uh, then A if B provides an external support and there is an external support. OK. Good, so this was more or less looking at a singleton uh, set. Let's actually look at a, at, a, at a larger set, because after all, what we want to do in this example, we want to assign faults to both A and B. So let's look at the set A and B and start again with the assignment that where, that where everything is unknown. Okay, so does A and B have a potential external support? Well, there is a rule that gives us A, but this relies on B, and B is in the set. Oh. Then there is a rule that gives us B, it relies on A, and A is also in the set. So there is no external support here, and an operator in this case, when it detects this, should actually make A and B false. And that's a situation that the fitting operator cannot handle, but we want to handle that. 
Okay, so what we want to characterize are the cases actually with the, with the, with the red cross, where we detected that, that atoms should be assigned false. And these are these two guys. And the, the concept that we, will, that we will coin is that of an unfounded set. And both of these guys are unfounded sets, but with respect or in the context of the partial interpretation, right? Because we've seen in particular in the first case that uh, whether this set is unfounded depends on the partial assignment that we are currently looking at. While here actually A and B is actually an unfounded set no matter how the uh, partial assignment looks like on this example. And now what we have to do is we have to make precise what it means for a set to be unfounded with respect to a partial assignment. So here's the definition of an unfounded set. It's a bit complex, but I hope you got the idea when looking at the motivating example on the previous slide. Well, if you ask me now, what is an unfounded set? I'd say it's a set of atoms without any external support. And without any external support means there are no rules whose head is in the set that are applicable or non-circular. There's all rules that could contribute to the unfounded set have either been found to be inapplicable or circular and thus depend on the unfounded set themselves. Okay, I hope this added a little bit to your intuition and not to your confusion. Let's look at the formal definition now. Okay, we want to define when a set of atoms is an unfounded set of a program with respect to a partial interpretation. And keep in mind, this partial interpretation tells us what we already know about the program. And now we want to define when the set is unfounded, but keep in mind, this means we want to find conditions that tell us when all members of the unfounded set can be assigned false. Hence, we are thinking a little bit in a negative way. After all, it's unfounded, not founded, right? Okay. Now, this is the case, a candidate said U is unfounded if for all rules that could contribute, contribute to the set, that is, all rules whose head belongs to the set, are either inapplicable, this is the first condition, or circular, and this is the second condition. In fact, the first condition is the same as in the sub-operator that determines false atoms in the fitting operator. So this is something that we already know. What is new actually is the second condition, which checks for circularity, and this is the so-called unfounded set condition. So more or less all rules that we can still use to derive elements in U require an atom in U themselves. And this gives us the circular uh, concept that we're looking for. Right? And this is the definition of an unfounded set. Okay, good. So here's the definition. Let's look at an example. Let us return to our simple motivating example and see whether our intuitions pan out in view of the formal definition of an unfounded set. Okay, first of all, and just to check this, the empty set is an unfounded set by definition. This is simply the case because the formal definition of an unfounded set says that for all rules whose head contributes to the set. Well, there are no such rules ever, and hence this condition is trivially true. Hence, uh, the empty set is an unfounded set for all programs, all sets, all partial interpretations. Check. Okay, now let's return to the sets that we also looked at at the, uh, at the beginning of this section. Now, our first candidate actually was the singleton set containing A. Now, let's be very pedantic, right? So we now have to look at all the rules that have A in the head. There's one such rule, A if B, but this rule cannot be ruled out because being inapplicable, simply because uh, a B can still be true or false, right, with, in, with respect to this partial interpretation. And also, uh, the second condition doesn't apply because B does not belong to the candidate set. Hence, the singleton set with A cannot be uh, determined as being unfounded. It is not an unfounded set with this, in this context. This changes if we change the context, so if we make B false. In this case, the single possible uh, external support, namely this rule here, is inapplicable. And it's the only rule that allows us to supply A. Hence, now actually this singleton set is an unfounded set. But keep in mind, this would also be determined by the fitting operator because the first condition of the unfounded set 
definition corresponds to the negative fitting operator. Okay, good. Now, the third example is a bit redundant in the sense that uh, it only it's a, it's a play on the first one, right? So, if we look at the singleton set containing A and want then we have to look at this rule here and check whether it's an external support. Well, we can't say it's inapplicable because even B is true in this setting. Also, B does not belong to the candidate set. Hence, um, this rule can still be applicable and the set containing A in the context where B is true uh, is not an unfounded set. Okay. I think it's obvious that the same arguments uh, that I applied for for these three cases here for saying that the singleton uh, set with A is either unfounded or not unfounded depending on the context also apply for B, right? So we don't have to go into these details. What is more interesting of course is after all the set that contains both A and B because after all we want to design an operator that allows us to make A and B false on this example. Okay, and indeed the set A and B is an unfounded set uh, why that? Well, again, we, let's be pedantic, right? So we look at all the rules that have heads in this set, and this is the first and the second rule, of course, right? And, and here we don't even have to check whether the rules are applicable or not, because the positive bodies of both rules um, are contained in the unfounded set candidate, hence they satisfy the second condition, and this makes actually A and B an unfounded set, no matter which partial interpretation we look at, because uh, both potentially supporting rules are both circular, satisfy the unfounded set condition, and hence A and B is an unfounded set of this program, no matter which partial interpretation we consider. Okay, I hope this confirmed a bit the intuition and it got you a better grip on the definition. Interestingly, what we can still come up with other characterizations of stable models by using the concept of unfounded sets. Now, just as we have done with completion and loop formulas, we can also characterize stable models in terms of unfounded sets. And this is a result due to Saka and Sagnolo. Anyway, the idea is that a model, a plain model, is a stable model if it does not contain any non-empty unfounded set. And here, in this case, actually, the context is given by the total uh, interpretation containing the model. So in other words, this says that in, for a model to be a stable model, each subset must have an external support. And again, I, I believe that this notion of external support is more or less the key to, to all these characterizations and also, of course, to unfounded sets and loop formulas, as we have seen. Interestingly, this theorem can be specialized by looking at loops. The previous result was specialized by Yu Yung Li by saying that a supported model, that is a model of the completion of the program, is a stable model if no loop contained in the model is unfounded with respect to the total interpretation obtained from the supported model. Anyway, so this is a, spe uh, well, a specialization of the theorem we've seen before. It's a bit in accord with, with the characterizations of completion and loop formulas because here we look at supported models. But this theorem is really interesting because after all, it provides an abstract characterization what happens in an ASP solver. Of course, from, again, from a, from, from a far perspective, but what happens in ASP solvers is actually that a program is compiled in its, into its completion formulas, and they are more or less forming the, the basic data structure that, that represent the constraints of the program. And then, somehow, where the exponential space risk is lying, a special algorithm is used that detects unfounded sets. And actually, this algorithm does not look at all possible sets. It only looks at cyclic structure. It only looks at loops. And so, in this way, this theorem actually gets us much closer to the characterization what happens in a solver. Of course, a solver does not first compute a supported model and then check whether the loops are unfound. It does all this no more, somewhere in between. But this is actually the characterization that is closest to what happens in an ASP solver. The other thing, just as a remark on the side, this theorem nicely also shows how loops and unfounded sets are related because here we don't talk about loop formulas, right? We talk about loops. So only sets that are induced by strongly, by strongly connected uh, subgraphs. 
Okay, anyway, so now that we did again this little excursion to characterizations obtained from unfounded sets, let's get back to the design of an operator. A key observation in view of designing an operator is that you can always take one unfounded set and another unfounded set, throw them together and you get again an unfounded set. So the observation is that you, the union of two unfounded sets is also unfounded. And of course you can not only do this with two of them, you can just take all of them and union them all and this results in what we call the greatest unfounded set. So perhaps the largest unfounded set would have been more appropriate, but let's stick with the greatest unfounded set. So, and well, this is again, the greatest unfounded set is of a program is always in, in, a, in, a, in a context, right? Where here we have a partial interpretation, and this is the union of all unfounded sets in the same context. And we can actually abbreviate this with this uh, notation here, UP of, uh, of the partial interpretation. And this already smells like an operator, right? Or something that we can plug into an operator. But I should zip it here and not tell too much. Anyway, if now you want to compute these guys here, right? Um, of course, you, this is now the, the greatest unfounded set, the union of all unfounded sets, but it's not very constructive. And actually, there is an alternative definition that actually I like very much. The key idea of this alternative definition of a greatest unfounded set is actually closer to this different or alternative representation of partial interpretations. While here we represent a partial interpretation with the true and the false atoms, you may remember that before we used the true and the possible atoms and they provided us with a lower and an upper bound on the stable models. Well, this approximation is perhaps not so relevant here, but this idea of possible atoms actually comes into play. Okay, let, let me try to make this precise. So what we have is our program and we have a current context given by the current partial interpretation that tells us for a few atoms that they have been found out to be true and others have been found out to be false. Now we take this partial interpretation and more or less pre-evaluate the program. So for instance, we kick out rules that are found already to be inapplicable. And now we take this pre-evaluated program and drop all the negative, the remaining negative body literals, which gives us a positive program, and we compute the consequences of this positive program. And this actually gives us the set of yet possible atoms uh, in view of a given partial interpretation. And now you can imagine that the impossible atoms, that is the ones that have no chance of being produced anymore, from which we already know that one cannot produce them anymore, they are unfounded and the set of all of these guys, of all of these impossible atoms in the current context are the greatest unfounded set. So this is my hand-waving intuition. Let's make this precise with some formulas. So let's become a bit more formal. Here's the definition of the greatest unfounded set of a program with respect to a given partial interpretation, or in other words, the result of applying the UP operator to our partial interpretation. So it's defined as a, a set difference. So the idea is that this expression here gives us the possible atoms in view of the current partial interpretation. And then when we subtract from the set of all atoms occurring in the program, the possibly derivable atoms, we get the impossible atoms. And this then constitutes the greatest unfounded set. Okay, I agree that I promised you actually that some of this alternative definition is a bit easier to grasp than the, the, the earlier one. And well, that doesn't really look uh, awesome, right? But let me try to explain it and perhaps then we can make it a bit more awesome. Anyway, so what do we have here? Looking, let's first look at this set here. So we look at all rules whose positive body literals have not yet been refuted. That is, none of them has been found to be false. Okay, so these guys uh, still make sense. And then we actually apply the reduct with respect to the true atoms. And there, two things are happening. First of all, we also evaluate here the negative condition. And we see that no negative condition, no negative body literal has been found to be true and is thus refuted. So this makes sure that among all the rules that we still have in our bag, um, 
they are still possibly applicable. So none of the positive nor negative body labels has been refuted. So either been found false or true. Okay. So this is now a partially evaluated program. And then we drop the negative of, of all these guys that satisfy this, this condition. We drop the negative body labels in order to obtain a positive program. And then we can compute the consequences of this program. And this gives us then all non-circular derivable atoms from the program in view of the partial interpretation. Right? And this is exactly this set here. So this gives us the possible atoms derivable from the program in the current context and then we subtract this from the, all the atoms in the program and what we get are the impossible atoms and this is the greatest unfounded set. Okay, I hope that after all this became a little bit more awesome and gave you more intuition actually on what uh, the greatest unfounded set is. And again, I think working with this already, already helps. Just play with some examples and I think then the intuition will become pretty clear. At least I like this definition, or at least I work with this definition, definition much more than with the, the original one. Anyway, I think now we, well, we got a certain grasp on unfounded sets and we are ready to pour this into the design of an operator. So, bear with me.